Okay, so data visualization. We're looking at this topic for the next two classes. Data visualization is something that's so basic. We've been doing it since they were born. We've seen stuff all around us. But we don't actually realize what, what's going on. Okay? And we don't actually realize some of the issues until we confront with that visualization. So this class today is really just a way to indicate some stuff and you might sit back and think that I, this is so obvious, this is a waste of time. But there's a few things in here that you probably haven't realized or noticed before. So let's take a look at those. In your piece of paper that you handed in yesterday that I asked you to give some feedback on topics you'd like to see. Um, it's interesting, a number of you had said we wanted to see like visualize all the three variables at a time. So we'll look at that tomorrow. Um, another group of people had said, I want to know what type of analysis to visualize to use to visualize different data. So here's the next major point for today's class. There is no single way to give you a list of if you're trying to achieve this, then do that. If this, do that. What you will see, however, is that data visualization is always objective. Depending on the story you're trying to tell to the reader of the graph, you can change and will change the graph's appearance. So I will show you the same two sets of data in different ways that actually tell a different story. Same data, two different stories. So it's very context dependent. And this is something that will grow on you over the next three, four months is that any time we do data analysis, you have to have a clear objective in mind. If you don't have that objective in mind, then the rest of your work is really just, you just, you could be going anyways. So having a clear objective in mind with the statistics and the data visualization is the key to, to choosing a program. And then how to visualize large data sets. Well, let's take a look up here. Um, here, one of the first questions is your coworker might be asking you, well, I've got this yield data in the batch system. So a single variable at the end of every batch, you calculate the real one. And you've got that for three years of data. Um, summarize the time frames. Okay, what type of plot do we use for this? What's the name of the type of plot? Time series plot. Okay. So a basic time series plot is showing you time trade. It's nothing, nothing spectacular to that name. It's a time series plot. The x-axis is time. The vertical axis is the yield. And you can plot an arbitrary amount of data along the line. That's exactly what's shown in the control rooms or operators. We're, we're going to look at, at that plot in detail tomorrow. The time series plot. And, um, sorry, in fact, the time series plot is next. We'll also look at some other uh, x, y plots tomorrow, scattered plots until Another example here is if you're trying to analyze the defect data, so you're trying to analyze the number and the type of defect, I'll show you some plots we can use for that tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's class. And then this next one here is batch data. Um, you've got 24 variables being measured against time over 300 minutes. That's a fairly large data set, 36,000 data points. Let's take a look at that. Now some of you have seen these sorts of slides before. I've spoken about batch data in React, Design, and some other cases. Let's just quickly recap what's going on here. On the left, we've got a batch reactor. So those non-chemical engineers in the room, this is where we make products in that reactor. And on that reactor, we measure several variables, temperature, pressure. We can be measuring the speed of rotation of that motor, the torque on that impeller. Um, and all sorts of variables indicate. So you may, let's say, have 14, 15 variables measured on that reactor. And the frequency with which you measure it is going to create a larger or smaller data set. So if you measure once every minute, once every five seconds, you're going to have a bigger or smaller data set. And you will run that batch for a certain duration. So in this particular example, we're saying we run the batch for 300 minutes, so five hours, you collect data once per minute, so you get 300 data points times 24 variables per batch. Okay. Now over a year or two, you may run 
50, 60 batches. So for every one of those, you collect that same type of data, but it's different. It's not that batch, even though you run it in the same way every time, will create a different data set for you. Okay? Your raw materials are different, your ambient conditions are different. And what you end up with is a large data set. Now, one way you can visualize that data is a show on the right hand side. So for that first part on the right hand side, top right, you're saying that's the collective tank level, what's leveled in the tank over time. Now what's the first thing you notice over there? All those multicolored lines. Some batches run to 150 minutes, some batches run a little bit longer, some a little shorter. This is a common problem in chemical processes. The operators do not run that batch for exactly the required amount of time. So you've got this variable duration. But what we're showing is one colored line per batch. So you're visualizing the data there from one variable over many batches. The second plot is showing the jacket temperature. The third plot on the right hand side is showing the high temperature. So we see that for the first 50 minutes approximately, we run at constant temperature 20 degrees, then we have a ramp up to 80 degrees, and some batches ramp up faster and slower than others. So we can start to see here's a problematic batch. Why the other batches ramp up pretty much at that angle, this batch ramps up at a much, much lower angle. So we don't cover this topic in this course. In the graduate level course, we look at batch data and how to deal with it. Because um, we're interested in far more subtle problems in that case. So we teach a grad graduate course on that. So, um, so if you're working in a company, your company may send you on a course to learn about these sorts of data sets and how to deal with them. But we don't teach that in this course. One of the things I noticed in yesterday's um, replies in the paper, people were asking to learn about topics which are really a little bit extended beyond what this course is. We have to learn some of the basics, linear regression, design of experiments, before we can get to using them on more sophisticated problems and processes. Okay, so what this course will give you, however, is a very solid foundation. My problem with statistics courses at other universities is they cover a little bit of everything and you do, do the very bad. But that's no good. What we'd rather learn is five or six methods which this course is going to teach you and we're going to learn them solve it. And the methods I've chosen to, to teach are the ones that are the base the foundation for other methods. So these squares is a baseline method that you have to understand in order to use some of the more sophisticated data analysis like multivariate methods. So we're going to be looking at that in the next uh, few months and really get to understand it. But unfortunately we have to leave some of these interesting topics like batch data analysis to other courses. And if you're interested in those I can give you um, some good references and videos and meetings to, um, to learn more about that. But it is possible to, to, to visualize those large data sets. Here's some references you might want to consider looking at if data visualization is something that's of interest to you. Over the last five or six years, this area has really um, taken off in terms of interest. So there's a good number of books on it. These are a few of the standard books that will set you um, in the path. Um, number five is particularly interesting, and so it will find number one and two that are classics in this area of data visualization. Okay, so as I said at the start, a lot of this looks too easy and too straightforward. Um, and the reason is we're very good, our eye is phenomenally good and picking out trends in a data set. How many of you have looked at a, at a journal publication or a, a, a graph recently in a newspaper or magazine and you had to like spend two or three minutes trying to figure out what's going on? Like, the message doesn't jump out of the right way. But you've got to figure out what's going on in the plot dimension, right? So you may struggle with the graph, but after a while of looking at it, maybe a minute or two, the message or what the author is trying to say with that plot becomes apparent to you. Now that's a bad plot if it's doing that. Okay? A good plot is one where you can look at it and within a couple of seconds you've got the idea of what's going on. Okay? 
And our responsibility as engineers is to figure out how to make good parts. Why? Because we're the guys and girls that are responsible for making those parts that our operators are looking at. And our operators are making decisions two or three seconds apart. They don't have time to decode what the plot is about. Okay? We have the responsibility to generate the plots for our operators and for our colleagues and our managers so that they, the message we're trying to convey comes up really quickly. Okay? So what I'll do next here is we'll look at some examples of bad plots and a few examples of good plots. And R, one thing that's nice about the R software package and why I selected it for this course is the default plotting settings in R have been set by people who are experts in the area of data visualization. So some of those names you saw up there earlier, they've been responsible for creating the software visualizations in R, or their research has influenced the plots in R. Okay, so by default in R, when you plot a plot, it usually comes out with good settings. Okay? Excel, MATLAB, not really. But R is actually really good at some of these defaults. Okay, so as I said here, our eyes are phenomenally good at picking up trends. Some of those trends might be sinusoids, spikes, outliers. We can pick up signal from noise quite, quite, quite well. As my former boss used to say, John McGregor, we've evolved to do that. And those that haven't evolved, those are the ones that are eaten by the lions, hiding in the bushes and the trees, right? So our eye has become very good at picking out details inside the cluttered mess. So you can pick out the threat that's lurking behind the trees and the bushes. We've evolved to be very good at picking out um, differences in data. So here's one um, that I found a few years ago. It's trying to show the temperature of the CPU over time. What do you see in that plot? What, what trends do we notice? Thank you. 
actually, it's, there's sequential readings of the time. Okay. It's just that they're so close together that it looks like. No, they're like, they're not really, I think, the first thing is that there's five that are Yeah, they're, they're, they're staggered because you're showing oh. entire weeks worth of data in that small period of time. They're actually oh. from spec vertically, they're microscopic in size. Oh, okay. okay. So that's, that, that's a good issue. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How else might, what might you change to better show this data? Um, well, you can change the axes from like 40 to 65. That makes more sense. Absolutely. So there's a big waste of that white space. We're going to talk about data density in a minute. We want to certainly start that vertical axis from 40 onwards. Uh, get rid of all the dots, the actual values. It's too much data to look at. Okay, get a moment. It's too much data to look at visually. Is that data useful? Is there a message from that data? Before you shake your head, no. Thank you. It's giving you a bit of information, showing you the variance, right? So we're getting an estimate of the variance in that vision. Okay, but is that entirely useful? Is that might that have been the original message in this plot? Okay, so here's the key thing. This is where I come back to my objective. If your objective is to show the reader, look, we've got very poor measurement accuracy. Like you're getting readings that are all over the place. That might be a good plot to show. If I was a physics professor or an electrical engineering professor and I wanted to teach my class about quantization, in other words, the ability or inability of an instrument to measure at decimal places, here we see this instrument only takes readings at 50. Etc. This is a great plot to show that we've got an instrument that's extremely quantized. But if my message is to show someone, hey, look at the time trends over here, then absolutely, as suggested by Holly, delete the red plots and just show the smooth trend. So here's my first attempt at doing this a little bit this afternoon. I was just redrawing that plot. You may want to just put all that scatter in a different shade of gray at the back, suppress it, and then emphasize and make pop the smooth values. Okay? That's your message. So two different plots, two different messages. Okay? That's the key thing here about data visualization. Absolutely the same data set, just different way of presenting them. Um, here's another issue that comes up in some defaults of the software. This was plotted in a Mac uh, Excel package. I'm plotting trajectories over time. Do you notice anything in those trajectories? Bear in mind about our human eye and its amazing capability. 
our eye can see about 25 dots per linear inch. So one inch, you can make up 25 and uh, 250 discrete points. In a square inch, you can make out about 650 points. Okay, that's phenomenal resolution that we have with our eye. And so what that means is you can compress that data set down to something much smaller, so small that you can put it on your cell phone and look at it sideways. Okay? And this is what this is used for, right? Spark lines are a tool to show time series data in very small pieces or very small spaces of information. Okay. So good for financial trends or for any time-based trend where the notice we don't have any x-axis and we don't have any y-axis. So implicit, the person that's going to consume this data is going to be aware of what they're looking at. If I was showing values from the stock market, someone looking at that would know that the vertical axis is dollars and the horizontal axis is time. So we strip away all of that superfluous clutter and we can compress and make use of the fact that our eye has such good resolution at picking up detail. And there again, we can still see the positive and negative correlation with it. Here's an example from uh, Google's website taken today. This is the prices of various stocks, exchange um, rate funds. What do we notice? Now, it may not be so clear at the back of this, but let's zoom in. If you were sitting at your computer, you could do this. Let's zoom in there. Notice that they've got spark lines. You can look at those spark lines by day, month, and year, and you can see the time trends very rapidly for all those stocks. Now, notice what a spark line is doing. What is the, notice what your eye is doing. You may not even be aware of it, but right away your eye is comparing stocks vertically. So just by presenting the data in this way, you're asking the user, look at this, compare the stocks to each other. Okay. What do you notice about some of those stocks? Notice the positive and negative correlations of them. Okay, so down here we've got trends that are inversely correlated to each other. One moves up, the other moves down. These two are positively correlated to each other. They flow up and down together. And that's a good thing because some of these stocks are intentionally traded so that they are blurred images of each other. So the rise of the is low. The intention is to follow the inverse of the trades. Okay. So smart lines show a great amount of detail. And we use this in engineering processes for visualizing data from our reactors, from our distillation ponds, from our heat exchangers. We want to be able to see this data compactly. Okay, so some of the companies out there are working on tools where you can take your cell phone, walk around the chemical plant, and as you walk and approach the distillation column, it starts to show the distillation column's data on your phone. Then you move towards the heat exchanger, the heat exchanger's data starts to show up as a spark line because we can show a compressed amount of data in a small space. So we can use these tools effectively in engineering as well. It's not restricted to finance. And if you've watched enough TV shows or been in a hospital or an ER or a doctor's office, you've probably had an ECG hooked up to you and this is what's come out there. So doctors and nurses are using the signals from the ECG in the same way. Nothing more than a spark line. They're inferring important information from the spacing, left to right, and the piece, top to bottom, in that plot. So an efficient uh, uh, representation of the data that you can see. So all of these are time series plots. Um, just some things to be aware of in time series plots. Don't try to distort them. Uh, sometimes you'll see magazines do this. They'll show a magnifying glass superimposed on a time series plot. Rather, a better and more honest way of showing data of that type is to show the original data set. So uh, here's the first data set. Notice the time goes from 0 to 80. And then below it, you can show the zoomed in version going from 0 to 20. So we're zooming in on this initial period of time. But don't overlay the plots or distort the plots. Rather show two plots of the same data set, the longer the time frame and the shorter time frame. If you're plotting data that are related to money, you 
we should adjust for inflation. Okay. So here, for example, is the car sales of car sales over time. Yeah, so sales on the vertical axis is the dollar amount over time on the horizontal axis. And if you looked at that plot, you see the usual up and down variation in each every year. It's seasonal periods where class sales are higher than others. But we're seeing an overall rising trend. Now, if we account for inflation or the cost of living with the CPI, that's the red line, so we divide those figures by the sales amount. We actually get a far more honest reflection of what's going on there. So we can actually see that, that the previous plot made it look like things would just keep on going up and up and up. But in reality, we see between 1970 and 1980, mid-80s, mid that the market was really very stagnant. And in fact, there was a depression in 75 and 83. So we reflect the data far more honestly if we account for inflation. And then the other thing that's important to notice, politicians will do this to you all the time. If you don't pay attention, they'll show you a limited piece of data and make you think that things are great. Try to spin the story in their favor. So if you looked at that first plot, you see this, this data going from $10 up to $16 that stock in three months. That's a 60% increase in three months, that's phenomenal. But let's give it a bit of context. Right? If we go up to the top right hand corner, that's the context that's to the left and the right. So when someone gives you a piece of data and it looks too good, always ask for more. Get the data around it. Get the context. Get the full picture. So then three and four show you even more context and um, that stop is what happens, which is how um, So let's move on to another plot. This is another one that you're familiar with, the bar plot. And you're mostly familiar with the bars being vertical, top to bottom, but there's no reason why they have to be. In fact, I argue in many cases it's easier that the bar plot is presented horizontally so that you can read those labels. Those labels that are normally on the category axis, the default in Excel and MATLAB and other tools is to put that category axis, so rotate that from plot 90 degrees, and other category axis labels get a green sideways from your head. Now we're okay doing that, we're comfortable in the Western world to tilt our head to the left and read from one to top. We do that enough times when we go to the library and other places. But why make it hard for you to read it? Like, there's no reason to make life hard for the person consuming your data set. So we put it at about 90 degrees and you make things more like easy. Notice the other thing that this bar plot has gone and done. If you go plot this data by default in Excel, it will present those bars in the order that you type them in, okay, which might have been alphabetical. So car expenses might have been first, and then at the bottom of the list you would add say personal items. Okay, so in alphabetical order. But here, notice what we've done. We've gone and reordered the data from the greatest expenses to the lowest expenses. And we presented the data rearranged. It doesn't change the bar parts. Makes it, in fact, easier for the reader because now the reader can quickly go find their expenses that cause or will consume the greatest amount of their income. So, small changes to the defaults make life a whole lot easier for the users of this plot. You'll see this coming up in an example later on. DeFasco or um, Arsenal retailers that are now called here in Hamilton, they use this when they present to their operators the top five or six causes of problems on their process. So they have an automatic computer run system that will find the problems on the process and they go rank them with you know, a bar that looks pretty much identical to that. Okay. So that ranking of the data really helps to tell a message and to convince your person reading this or your um, stories. There is one problem though. We'll see this many times especially in financial uh, documents, is they uh, present a bar plot as a time series plot. Now there's absolutely no need for that. Right? If you look at that bar plot over here on the left hand side, it's presenting for you 
uh, dollar figures on a quarterly basis as a bar count. We don't need that. Those dollar figures are more accurately and more honestly presented to you as a time series one. That is in fact what they are. So you're forcing something into a different form, that's the first mistake. And then the second mistake that we'll see that is happening here on the left side is that you're using up so much ink to convey the same message. So we'll talk about data ink, but there's no need to use all that ink to present that message that's over there on the right hand side. So on the right is the far more efficient way, and you can in fact see the trends more clearly on that side. What do I mean by data ink? Data ink is ink that you use. And we're not trying to save ink from a technological point of view, we're trying to save ink from the fact that every pixel that you put on the screen, the user has to decode. Okay, so we don't want to make the user work harder than they need to. So if you look at a bar plot, it's extremely inefficient to use of ink. A bar plot wastes ink because the left edge over here, the right edge over here, they carry the same amount of information. That distance from zero, up to 85, that vertical black line, and then again on the right, that vertical black line, conveys the same piece of information that it's 85. Well, we know it's 85 because we've got the number that it's 85. We've also got that horizontal line, that the top of the line is telling 85. The shaded area is in proportion to 85. So you've got this all repeated, repeated, repeated for no need, and there's no benefit to all the so here's a principle we use for data visualization: is to use the data, uh, sorry, to use the ink in such a way that you maximize our information that we're trying to convey. Or in other words, when you take a plot in Excel, the default that you get, take a look at it and ask yourself, what can I remove from that plot so that I still carry my message? So after you put a plot on the screen, ask yourself, what can you delete so that you don't lose information? Okay. And until you get to a point where you cannot delete anymore, then you maximize the data and information. Okay, and that, that comes down to when you see this a lot in publications. You see pie charts or you see bar plots like this, where you could have replaced all of that, meat, that uh, ink with just a simple table. Okay, so people think, I have to present everything as a graph. Well, no. If there's one other message you take away from this lecture today is tables are quite OK. We can all read, right? So we don't have to see everything as a picture. Yes? I think that's an assumption that's not fair. People don't always prefer to read figures. Uh, graphs and numbers. Because you can see exactly the same information from that table as you can get from that department. The ranking that Ontario receives from Manitoba receives Quebec is quite apparent. And the profit is quite apparent. But this and it takes you no less or more time to do it. So it's true for large data sets that the figure is more useful than the table. Absolutely. But there is a sweet spot, typically 20 or fewer points, where a table works just as well, and sometimes more efficiently. So don't feel you need to convert everything to a picture or a figure to make it work. Well, again, sometimes if you use shading, you can set up what we call visual vibrations in the, in the image there. That's not so prevalent anymore. Most software packages are moved away. And then finally, I present to you the worst part I've ever had encountered. Uh, there's absolute, there's like so many things wrong with that figure. I can leave that with you to, to work through your own time. And the company will remain nameless in that case. Okay, so bar plots, let's just summarize quickly here. Horizontal bars will work just perfectly in many instances. In fact, they work better in many cases than vertical bars. You can put, here's an interesting thing you can do, those labels in a bar plot can often be put inside 
So if we go back to that first one, if I made those blue bars, if I took away the blue and just left the outline of the bar, I could push the label into the bar. So if I needed to save space on a small screen or a cell phone, I could move that word house expenses into the bar. And the other text I could put just outside to the right edge of the bar. Okay, so there's, you can press that plot to show those small files. Um, and usually the rule of thumb is that non-category actually should start at zero. So it's showing some things like dollars. So you should always give a baseline of zero to the reader. Let's move to box plots. Box plots are what we call the five number summary of data. So people were asking, how can I summarize large data sets? How can I deal with a large data set? Well, take the case where you're dealing with a, a large data set with just a single variable. So one column from that large data set. If I take that one column from my large data set, I can represent it like that. Now that might be several hundreds of thousands of rows. Okay? And I can sort it from low to high. So sort from low to high. Computers will do that very efficiently for us these days. We don't have to worry about that. And let's recap some terminology. For the point that's now in the middle of it here, that's your median. Okay, that's not, this is all, all revision stuff for you. That's your midpoint here. We call that the 50th percentile. It's just another name for the median. The point that's 25% and 75% of the way through there, those are my 25th and 75th percentiles. And we give another name for that. We also call it my first quartile and my third quartile. So you can divide the data into quarters. You have your first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, and fourth quartile. And this number that from the column, just sort it out from below the height and pick out that number. That number that you get over there, that's your 25th percentile. And respectively, the same thing. Now, this distance over here, we call that the IQR. That's the distance from the 25th to the 75th percentile. So, subtract this value at 75 from the value at 25. And that value you now have the equation of distance gives you what's called the interquartile range, IQR. So let's summarize our data. We can summarize a long column of data. We can summarize by five numbers. We can report the lowest value in the table in the column, the highest value in the column, the median, the 25th and the 75th percentile. Those five numbers are an efficient summary of the data. The low and high obviously give us an idea of the extremes of the data set. The median tell gives us an idea of the midpoint. And the 25th and 75th percentile give us an idea of the spread or the variance or the standard deviation in the data set. Why, what do I mean by that? Well, here's a great illustration I found on Wikipedia last year to explain this topic. If we take data from a normal distribution, We'll look at that in two, three classes from now, and we'll see why in engineering processes many data sets come from a normal distribution. But if the data come from a normal distribution, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, this distance here captures half of the data set. The distance between minus infinity and up to the 25th percentile, that captures 25% of the data set. That number isn't quite 25 because we're not accounting for that small amount. So 25, 50, 25. So the distance between the first and the third quartile gives you an idea of the spread of the data set. A variable with that distance being larger has greater spread. And we like the IQR because it's robust to outlines. We're going to talk about robustness to classes. So it's a great way to summarize a data set. The standard deviation is not robust and will blow up. 
IQR or metal blower gives you a very good idea of the spread or variance of the So it's a good, good way to summarize. Okay, so let me just uh, end off here by showing this example. This is um, one of my first jobs I did when I finished up. I worked at a sawmill in Quebec for several months, and this was great because I got to see how sophisticated the lumber industry is in Canada. So if you take a piece of, of a tree and cut it, they cut out two by fours, and the way that the sawmill does that is they cut it in such a way so they get the greatest amount of material from that tree. So they don't want to waste it. Well, how do they do it? Well, they take every single piece of tree that comes into the mill gets digitally scanned by a set of lasers, and the computer calculates in a few seconds what the best way to cut that tree is so they can get the maximum number of two by fours. And it does it by rotating that 3D. Okay, so I'll show you how that looks in the video. Um, so don't worry too much about the sound, the sound is just the noises of the sawmill. But there you see the trees coming in from the, as they were loaded off the trucks, they come in. Um, they still got a little bit of residual mark on them. And they get through through the process. And in a minute you'll see where it comes up to the scan. It's going to digitally scan the 3D image of each of those blocks. So they can line up and the one in there. Okay, and just as you can see it entered over here, over there, right in the middle of the screen, there's a set of lasers that's, that scan that block, and then that device there rotates the log in a three-dimensional way, left, right, and it gives it a bit of a twist to angle it into the saw way so it gets the maximum number of two by fours or two by eights or two by six or So there's a little bit of a pause as it does a calculation and then that tree goes in. Now, when those individual pieces of wood go further along in the process, so we see them come out later on, there's the cutout pieces. Each of those gets re-scanned again, because now they're going to have edges that flare out. It's not quite straight on the left and the right edges. So they get re-scanned again, and they get cut the final time, and then they go to the dry and finish. And what they do is at the end, <coughs> after it's been processed, they also get scanned the final time, and it measures the thickness of the wall. So what we've got here on the date, on the course website, we have this data set, and you're going to look at it in the assignment, where they've measured the thickness of that piece of wood at six points. So at, at those six corner points. And what we did with the company is we plotted the box plots, showing the profile of the walls at those six positions. We can very quickly see that where the saws are off. So we ended up using this as a, as a way to tell when to stop the process and change out the blades and recalibrate. Because when you start getting high variance, you can get off. Like you're not achieving the thickness that you want. So we can see already at position one and three and six that the interquartile range is quite high. So what I mean by that is there's my median in the solid black. And then the thinner black lines, those are the interquartile range. So that range is much higher at position six than it is at five. So at position six, we're getting this, this thickness that's out of that more, large than normal. Also, position one is showing a large number of outlines. So, very, very efficient way to summarize a large data set. Many, many more. And you track this over time. And then the black line in the middle is the median, and though that should consistently be at about 1680, is what the target is it's coming in. So if the median is starts to move away from that point, they also know that it's time to, to change out the blades. So a box plot is a great way to, um, to visualize the data. Now sometimes you'll see that the mean might be used instead of the median. Outliers here I've shown as 
France. So outliers are any points that are beyond what we call the whiskers. So the whiskers over here, there's my top whisker and there's my bottom whisker. Let's quickly go look what those whiskers are. Those whiskers are calculated, in fact, um, based on the take, you go from that first quartile and you go minus 1.5 times the IQ1. So that's your lower whisker. And your upper whisker is you start at the third quartile and you go up one and a half IQ lines. And then you put your whiskers. Now, those whiskers then theoretically cover the vast majority of the data. There's only a small amount here in that lower tail and in that upper tail that should be outside. And those are the points we show with circles. Those are considered outliers. Because these are points that are statistically far away from the center of the case. So we show those as the dots up there and as outliers. So I've, I've written up there what some of the variations are for that. And then finally, an interesting plot called the violin plot is if you take that, that same box plot, it is shown in the middle, and then superimpose symmetrically the distribution histogram. So that, that curved line at the top and then the is very to the low shows the actual distribution on the histogram. So superimpose. So the five numbers give you a summary of the sector and the spread, but you also want the original distribution shown. Add that on, superimpose it, and we get what's called a violin one. So R, R will be this for you as well. Okay. 